Good morning. Nice to see everyone here this morning. If you're new here, welcome. If you're old here, welcome back. If you're wearing white, you can do it today, but after that, no. I'm sorry, I looked it up. I always thought my mom was lying to me, but no. It's true, I'm sorry. So put the white away. I have several announcements. We have a very, very good treat this morning. Mr. DeCourcy is going to sing for us. We have Jackie back. She's going to give us our message. And we're having a potluck in the basement. And I just happen to have a joke to go with that. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> You're not laughing. Oh, okay. There was a man. And he went to a potluck with his wife, and they sat down, and they started to eat. And the man said, honey, I don't think I can eat this. It's making me sick. And he said, she said, well, don't say anything. Just eat it. And he said, well, what if it kills me? And she says, well, then we'll know what killed you. <laughs> but don't be afraid. It's all good food, I'm sure. <laughs> I also want to take a minute to thank Glenn for the new bushes in the front. If you haven't seen them, go out and take a look. Okay? Pardon me? And Bill Harmon. And Bill Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. So if we'll give him a round of applause for that. Okay. Anybody else got announcements? New? Yes, Miss Vicki. Liz Stevens had a hip replacement. Leah Stevens had. Yeah, Leah Stevens had a hip replacement. Okay. But she's recovering. Good. That's great. Anybody else? We have umpteen birthdays in September. Umpteen. You know that? There's umpteen birthdays. So should we take time to sing happy birthday to everybody? And instead of going down the whole list of names, just say, happy birthday, God bless you. Okay? Are you ready? Judy, can we do that? <laughs> Don't do that to me. You scared me. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. And that will be followed up by somebody who can really sing.
Thank you, Gary. Beautiful as always. Will you please stand now and join me in the responsive call to worship? Our God, in the glory of late summer, we come to worship through thou Give us insight this morning into how the work of our hands is part of the work of your hands. We join with you in lifting the heavy hearted, comforting the sorrowful, and calming the anxious. Fill us with the joy of service this morning. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you join me with a unison prayer? Lord, on this Labor Day, we thank you for the blessing of work. We ask for strength to complete each day. We ask your guidance for everyone seeking employment. And we ask that you be with those whose faces we may never see, but who work tirelessly each day for the good of us all. Amen. Our open In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this wine. In remembrance of me, pray for the time when God Forty-five. If you would like to follow along, that can be found on page 471 of your Pew Bible. <coughs> my heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. 
You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemy. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You love, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber and robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Our second reading comes from James chapter 1, verse 17 through 27, and that can be found on page 1011. Every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will will he of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the world, word and not doers hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is righteous, if he thinks he is religious, excuse me, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before the God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. It is a pleasure to be here. I am very thankful for the people in this church. I'm thankful for the wonderful music. That's beautiful. The the people who are here early and preparing things and doing that for you so that things go smoothly. Very seldom am I a part of things that go smoothly. You will find that out about me as we move along and get to know each other. It is a pleasure to be here. I'd like to begin this morning with um, a brief story. On a mission trip to Minnesota several years ago, we took two vehicles, a van and an SUV, filled with adolescents just eager to be on a trip with all their pillows, all their sleeping bags, their air mattresses, and we also had backpacks and school supplies that we collected and shopped for to help young children there who were in need. We were packed in, and we wrote on our vehicles saying, Jesus loves you, and honk if you love Jesus, along with drawings of hearts and crosses and smiley faces. Oh, we were excited. (laughs) And as we traveled, the youth were thrilled every time someone actually did honk. People noticed us, and we felt like we were supported in our mission. And then came the morning. I took my niece with me, and we got an early start so we could go to the local caribou coffee shop there by the lake. We were there to get coffee for all the leaders, and I was approached by a smiling gentleman who asked, is that your SUV out there? I was slightly concerned because I thought, oh, did I leave the lights on? Did I park in a no parking zone? I also thought, oh, he probably noticed that um, all the writing and he's wondering what kind of mission we're on. So I responded happily, yes. And his smiling face suddenly changed to a distorted and angry creature and asked me, so, does it inhale birds and spit them out the tailpipe covered in black oil? Honk if you love Jesus. Are you kidding me? (laughs) What? And then he repeated it. And I looked at him in disbelief. And at least 10 different thoughts raced through my mind, such as, do you not know that that vehicle safely hauled youth eager to come here to help you in your community? Do you not know that we brought backpacks filled with school supplies for children in need? Do you not know that we are sleeping in the attic of a church with no air conditioning and 90 degree August weather so we can help the people and spread the gospel of Jesus? Did he have a problem with Jesus or the SUV? None of those things could come out of my mouth. I was in the presence of a Pharisee, I felt. And I was being judged for the filth that I was apparently spreading. But 
was completely overlooked. Nothing I would say would help him understand. He was looking to discredit us. And so I just responded with, that's not my SUV. And it was the truth. It was honest. And I just turned away because it was a borrowed vehicle. We borrowed it. His mind was already made up that we were on the side of evil. Little did he know that he and I, if we could have had a conversation, he would have known that we were both concerned about pollution. But the source of the pollution and the kind of pollution we were not in agreement on. And until we can agree upon that, we will continue to have the same arguments. Uh, don't worry. This isn't uh, going to be a go green or an anti-green political message. It is far greater than that, far more important than that. As Jesus explains in scripture, it is a matter of the heart. The Gospel of Mark, it's believed to have been the first of the Gospels written, written by John Mark, who was a companion of Peter and later Paul. And by reading Mark, we can learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and what it means to bring every area of your life under his lordship. So here we are. It's after the feeding of the 5,000 and after Jesus walking on the water, and they are now in the land of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and no matter where they went, people flocked to them as they recognized Jesus and his followers, bringing everyone who was in need of healing. Now the Pharisees and the scribes had also come from Jerusalem, as we read in Mark verse 7, 1. And as the people became more and more excited about Jesus, the Pharisees grew in their hatred of him, so much so that they also went where Jesus went. They didn't just happen to be there. They, too, were looking for Jesus, for different reasons, of course. Now, depending on the time of year, some sources say that to travel this distance, they would have had to have gone possibly up to 90 miles or needed to travel for three days. That's some serious hatred. I imagine that as the Pharisees got closer to where Jesus was, that their grumbling became even more intense. Then, as they are there, they witness this. The disciples eating with unclean, unwashed hands. Now, their concern was not at all for the health of the disciples, but for the failed practice of ceremonial washing. Now, mind you, this was a practice or a tradition from the elders, from the Old Testament, but not a requirement of God. The Pharisees were good at taking traditions and practicing them, as well as expecting others to practice them as a way to show they were good, they were clean, they were acceptable, and in good standing with God. After all, the scrolls, today we know in scripture as Leviticus, it explained how the high priest Aaron, as ordered by God, 
was to wash and be clothed in clean white linen before entering the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, we know as Yom Kippur. And this was a public ceremony as he would wash behind a screen and dress in pure white linen, doing this several times as he would atone first for his own sins and then the sins of the people. This ceremonial once-a-year tradition became a necessary act required by religious leaders of all people by way of ceremonial washing. In other words, a man-made tradition. And this act, this expectation, the expectation became more about the tradition over scripture. When we do ceremonies or keep traditions, that's not bad in itself unless it is done to take the place of scripture. And scripture points to Jesus. So is what we do for Jesus? Or is what we do for ourselves? See, Jesus tells them in verse 8, You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Why is this important but for the fact that we can't save ourselves? The ceremonial washing of the high priest was to show the holiness of God, not man's ability to make himself clean. There must be the realization that as Jesus says in verse 6, when he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then Jesus explains to the crowd in verse 15, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. This is also difficult for the disciples who have grown up their whole life with traditions, believing them to be necessary to demonstrate their righteousness. So in verse 17, when the disciples ask him about this, Jesus has to get a little more graphic as he explains, bad food can make one sick, but it can't make you spiritually unclean. With this, his disciples don't miss the point that he makes. It's he is saying and declares all foods clean. This is not because the law is no longer good. But it is because Jesus came to fulfill the law. The commands God had given to Israel that we read about in Leviticus 11 that tells us about unclean animals was to teach them about holiness and unholiness. It was never meant for people to search for external reasons for their unholiness, nor search for external solutions for holiness. Jesus clearly explains that we are not defiled by what we take in. We are defiled by what comes out of our hearts. So it is the heart that needs to be examined. Mm, that heart. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? 1 Samuel 16, 7, when Samuel went to anoint one of Jesse's sons to become king after Saul was rejected by God, Samuel had been sure it was Eliab, but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. Psalm 53, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. The Pharisees thought that if they could make themselves look good on the outside, following customs and traditions, putting on a ceremonial display, then they would appear to be good enough. To be good enough. But the wickedness is still within. As Jesus reveals this to the Pharisees and to the people, this revelation would make the Pharisees equal with common people. We are all equally in need of being saved. Traditions and customs can be tools that we use to connect us with Scripture. But when customs and traditions become the focus or become more important than Scripture itself, then the Word of God has been abandoned for the traditions of man. That is, man or mankind, men, women, deciding to try and save him or herself. This may sound like bad news, because I just basically told you, your heart's polluted. And we do have polluted hearts. Verse 21 through 23 of Mark 7 is Jesus telling the disciples what each person is, including us, capable of. And it's bad news. For it is from within a person's heart that evil thoughts come. We read that in our scripture this morning. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil things come from inside and defile a person. So, now if you are sitting there and feeling like I have just given you a terrible diagnosis, you need to know there is a cure. There is a source that can transform the internal problem. But if we sit here and we think, well, I'm not that bad. I only have a few of those issues that we read about in the scripture. Or I'm not as bad as somebody else I know. Well, then you might be a Pharisee that prefers to point out the shortcomings of others, maybe even cornering them in the local coffee shop to inform them of their evil ways. The Pharisees had clean hands and yet wicked hearts. The disciples had dirty hands. Dirty from the work to spread the gospel, but their hearts 
or being transformed by the very word of God. You see, the good news is Jesus came for that reason and can transform our hearts too. What do our lives look like when we live with transformed hearts? Well, your personal practices become less important than what God's will for your life is. And you start to find that God's will actually brings you joy. We read in James 1, verse 27, what does it look like? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The SUV that we had borrowed and carried backpacks with messages to children to tell them about the transforming love of God. The man was too busy being angry about the outward presence of dirt and pollution. We can be a vessel, a vessel that carries the message of the saving power of Jesus when we first, one, realize our own hearts are unclean. Two, understand we aren't capable to do the cleansing ourselves. And three, to know that Jesus does the cleansing. And it's by his atoning sacrifice on the cross, and it isn't because we deserve it, but it's all because of the love of God and the grace of God and his acceptance of us. That feeling that we might have that concerns us that we might not be good enough, it's pretty accurate. And this world is filled with lies that appear to show us ways to be accepted. And all those things take us deeper and further away from God. But when we finally realize we're not good enough, that the problem is within, we will finally see that we can lean on Jesus because he is good enough and he traded places with us. Hebrews 10.22 Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Although the diagnosis that I give this morning sounds scary and we need a new heart, the cure is already available. Ezekiel 36 Verses 25 through 26, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Seek it out each and every day. This is the gospel, the good news, and it's offered to you. Thank you, God, and amen.